Hispanic Heritage Month kicks off September 15th, and it's a nationwide celebration honoring the many achievements, histories, and cultures of Hispanic and Latino Americans. We've invited a community, uh, we've invited community members from around the First Coast to talk about Hispanic heritage and some of the events that they are curating. So let's give a warm welcome to Monica Hernandez, president of the First Coast Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Good morning, Monica. Hi, good morning. Thank you for having me. Attorney Elizabeth Ruiz, managing a partner at Ruiz Law and Accident and Immigration Attorneys of Jacksonville. Uh, Ms. Uh, Ruiz, how are you? Doing, doing well. Thank you for having me today. And, and, and just to be clear, like we're calling you Lisa because Lisa is what everybody calls you, right? That's my nickname. All right. right. That's your nickname. Okay. I don't want people to be like, you said she was Le- uh, Elizabeth. <laughs> and just, we're just getting it right. Then we've got Eric Garcia, treasurer of First Coast Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Eric, how are you, sir? Yeah, doing well. Good morning. Buenos dias, everyone. All right. And Dr. Rebecca Dominguez Carmini, an oral historian and founder of, you know what, I'm going to let you say the organization that you founded. Okay. I I founded Voces Hispanas, and it's an oral history collection. That is amazing. Thank you for having me. I would have totally butchered it, so that, that's why I give it to you. But oral histories are my jam, so I, I, I can't wait to talk a little bit more about that. Listen, caller, uh, callers, listeners, listen, you can join the conversation. Call us at 549-2937. You can tweet us at FCC on air. You can email us at firstcoastconnect.wjct.org or message us on the First Coast Connect Facebook page or Instagram. So I'll just open this up to the panel Um Actually, I'll start off uh, by uh, with uh, you, Monica. So what exactly is uh, Hispanic Heritage Month? So Hispanic Heritage Month really was um, started in 1968 as Hispanic Heritage Week as a way to celebrate um, the history, the culture, and the contributions of American Hispanics in the United States. Um, and then in 1988, it actually transitioned to a full month from September 15th through October 15th, which is today what we celebrate. Um, and, you know, people always wonder and tell me, like, why is, is it like from mid-September to October 15th? And it's really because uh, during, during that month or that transition period is where you're going to have the independence of many Latin American countries. So we're going to have Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, in Nicaragua, and then Mexico and Chile celebrate their independence on September 16th and the 18th, respectively. And then on Columbus Day, or Dia de la Raza, which is on October 12th, falls within that same, you know, 30-day period. So it does have a reason as to why it's from September 15th through October 15th. But really, I always like to highlight it and, and recognize that really we just utilize that time to to make sure that we are celebrating the diversity that we have within our within our culture um, within our you know ethnicity because really being latino being hispanic is an ethnicity it's not a race therefore we look different we think different i mean all of us here we are completely different yet we're all hispanic and or latinos yeah i was i was about to ask you about that because as you are naming off all the different countries that have uh, Independence Day is coming up. Uh, that you know, when when we talk about Hispanic uh, Hispanic heritage and Hispanic culture, it, it's not a monolith. Like there are so many different types of Latinos right. and countries and and all of that. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So so if you think as you know, if you think of of the term Hispanic, really is it's just it's it's a way of identifying a whole community right we sort of all got lumped into this box where um you know if 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 you want to put one community into a box it is hispanic right and it's it is a community that is of um spanish the the language you know it's from they speak spanish however it was we're different right you i i have friends that are hispanic that are latinos but they're asian right their heritage their parents are from, you know, from Asia, or you have indigenous people that are equally Latinos, that are equally Hispanics. Um, you have African descent individuals that are also Latinos. And it's equally, right, it's, it's all about um, the ethnicity in the country where you're from. I want to open it up to the panel a little bit more and just ask, um, talk to me a little bit about the Hispanic culture in Jacksonville and the First Coast. 
Uh, I can definitely say that it's 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 grown uh, over the past ten years. Uh, uh, Duval County, St. Johns County, and Clay County have all uh, tremendously increased, uh, according to our Census Bureau. Uh, so the um, amount of uh, uh, Hispanics. Uh, moving to the area, uh, starting their own businesses, uh, has definitely grown over the past 10 years. Elizabeth, uh, can you tell us some of the, the struggles that uh, this growing community has in, in, in Jacksonville? Well, I think uh, the, the challenges that um, we face are very similar to the ones that are faced by Hispanics on, on a national level. And um, immigration reform being one of the top challenges that we face right now um, and then I know that there are also challenges to accessing health care um, and and others that um, have been affected by recent changes in in state law I was um, having uh, lunch with a friend of mine who is uh, Latino and when we were talking about this subject he said like you know you, you just need to make sure that everybody knows it's way more than just tacos and tequila it, it, it's a lot deeper than that. It's Absolutely. it's 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 a a, a very rich uh, history, and I I just wanted to dive into that a little bit. So, uh, Dr. Uh, Dominguez Carmini, uh, can you shed some light on that? Well, as Monica referred to, all of the Hispanics, we're all different, and of course, our histories are all different. We come from different parts of the world, and uh, I think that. I hate to use this word, but I'm going to use it. That diversity that exists is is very palpable in our population, and uh, we're just all very different. I think that we, even in this room, represent different countries and mm -hmm. backgrounds. For example, my um, my dad is from Peru. He came here to the United States in the 70s, and he um, after he married uh, my mom, who is of uh, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant descent native Floridian um, so um, I grew up in a very uh, just I guess rich uh, cultural background um, that uh, comprised of the food and um, the different you know the, the Spanish language um, but yet at the same time on on my mom's side there there was also there's rich culture that derives from here, Southern culture. An interesting fact is that um, my one of my great, I were not one of, but well, yeah, the uh, on my uh, my uh, maternal grandmother's side, um, we the one of our ancestors was the founder of Nashville, and was a general wow. in the Confederate wow. Army. Wow. So uh, I've had the chance to grow up as an American, born and raised here, but at the same time. Um, exposed to cultures from different you know parts of the world and especially peru and monica you're the president of the first coast hispanic chamber of commerce can you tell me a little bit about what the chamber of commerce does absolutely so as an organization we um we represent all nationalities right so even our events are highlighted and are inclusive of all the different countries in latin america and the caribbean um, so as, a, as, a, as an organization, really, we focus on advocating for Hispanic business owners, for entrepreneurs, uh, for creating um, connections that are ultimately going to improve um, the betterment of the Hispanic business community. We also work closely with other organizations um, within the city that can ultimately provide more opportunity for business owners that can represents that we can advocate so for instance you know as, as i started with the chamber one of the main focuses that i have was to be able to find um um get programming that is bilingual for you know for the entrepreneurs so for instance you know working with the sbtc as the sbtc is providing training courses and programs for the hispanic community they now have a bilingual speaker that is ultimately being able to meet with entrepreneurs, with individuals that are starting to open businesses um, that are, you know, as a fastest growing minority, that is what's happening, right? They are opening, we are opening businesses that are any fast, at a faster rate than any other community. Uh, being able to work with, with JSAP, that now they also have a, a representative that speaks Spanish that is ultimately allowing a business owner to, uh, to learn in their language. I always jokingly say, you know, it's very difficult to learn math in a different language. 
right, let alone to understand the tax code in, in a language that's not yours. Um, it's not about a handout. It's about opportunity, right? It's about having the opportunity to learn, to be able to have the, um, the ability to ask the questions in Spanish, even if, you know, even if the program is in English. So, you know, I think it was last year that we hosted a, um, a two-day federal series event where we had individuals from the city come in and speak about the various programming that are available, how to, you know, how to gain an access to contracts within the city. And even though the speech, you know, some of the speakers were not um, bilingual, we were there. We were able to have somebody from the SBA that was bilingual that way. If anybody wanted to ask questions in Spanish, it was it was an option, right? Um, I personally moved to the U.S. 24 years ago. I had to learn the language from the bottom, right? I, I only I think I only knew the colors and the numbers at the time. So I understand, right? I still do math in Spanish. I still do certain things in Spanish because that is my first language. Um, so I fully understand, you know, what it means. And I've seen it. I've seen the struggles through my mom, right? Through the lens of my mom mm -hmm. where, you know, creating a, a business, a business plan, understanding how to gain access to capital. And that is actually one of the largest and biggest um, um, limitations, you know, that are that are impacting business owners, minority owned businesses is gaining access to capital. Yeah, I would imagine if uh, if if you don't speak the language, it's English uh, and you're trying to get capital from a bank, it's it's a huge barrier. 100%, right? And I think we also have to take into consideration the, what it means from a cultural standpoint, right? In the U.S., we do, businesses, we do business differently than we do in Latin America or, in, you know, in, in Spanish-speaking countries. Um, here, you have to, you know, have a full understanding of making sure that your personal, you know, that your small business banker is your best friend, right? That you have that relationship with the banker, that you have an understanding of, you know, your FICO score, having a budget, uh, how to do a, a business plan all of those are while it may sound simple you know for your for your average person it's you know it, it is something that can be or make a difference in the experience and the success of that business not to mention right um, gaining access to a contract whether it's through the city or for the or within the states that is going to pivot your business that much more right you're going to be able to scale your business because now you have access to contracts um, that are going to allow you to, you know, gain more, have more businesses, and then also improve. You can join the conversation at 549-2937. You can tweet us at FCC on air. You can email us at firstcoastconnected.wjct.org, and you can find us on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, Dr. Dominguez uh, Carmini, I, I wanted to turn to you to talk a little bit about the project that you do with Oral Histories. Um, so are you gathering oral histories here on the First Coast? Um, how does that work? And, and, and how can people hear these histories? I, I, I love oral histories, probably more than I love reading histories in, in history <laughs> books, because you actually get to hear what a person's experienced and lived, you know? Exactly. You hear the tone of their voice, mm -hmm. the emotion. Uh, and I also take videos as well, so one can see the emotional impact of the questions or the life history that they're relaying to you. And the, the trials, the tribulations they, that they went through to get here. Um, I originally began this project in 2021. Uh, Jacksonville Historical Society approached me and asking if I could give a history, uh, a, a presentation on the history of Jacksonville Hispanics, uh, a more recent history is what they asked for. And I said, sure, I'd love to. So I went to their archives and unfortunately, the information that I was uh, able to access was very scant. And that being the case, I did what comes naturally to me. I'm an oral historian, so I asked them how they felt about me creating an oral history collection. And they were very, very happy, to say the least. So I embarked on this journey. I met some key individuals in the uh, Hispanic community here in particular, uh, Mario de Cunto from um, the, let me see if I say this right, the Duval County Democratic Hispanic Caucus. He was one of the ones I was able to reach. And uh, he was very interested in the project and said, yes, I'll help you. So through the snowball method, he gave me Monica Hernandez's name. And once we talked and we <laughs> shared, it was instantaneous, a love affair. <laughs> Yeah. And she was very committed as well. So between Mario and Monica, 
we started rolling and the the introductions came in i followed up with phone calls and the rest is history within a three-month time period with covid in full force of course wow. i did mainly i did all zoom actually uh, but i was able to get 40 oral histories in a three-month period of time which i thought was fantastic because it was only moi yeah, well, was doing it. as someone who does oral histories for a living, that's pretty fantastic. That's a lot of work in, in three months' time. What, what were uh, some of the stories that you found that really moved you? Oh, gosh. Um, a lot of immigration stories uh, were very uh, telling. And, and the, the obstacles and the hardships that individuals encountered uh, when first arriving here, uh, they didn't speak English. They were thrust into a, a situation where um, it was either speak English or or die. You know, yeah. it, you had to really strive a lot. And for some individuals, they ended up going the wrong way at a young age because they couldn't understand the language, and they just had such difficulty. Uh, and of course, the some of them had been traumatized by war by um, uh, this, this desaparecidos in their native countries. So they had a lot of trauma coming here. So they had that to deal with, plus the burden of learning the, the language. Uh, but they triumphed, and uh, it, it's just very warm, warming to the heart to listen to these stories and, and see them triumph and become successful uh, business people, professors, uh, leaders in the Hispanic community, and they have so much to offer them. Yeah. We're going to go to the phones. We've got Charlie in Jack's Beach. Charlie, how are you this morning? Hey, guys. I'm doing great. Um, so my kids are grown, but in hindsight, if I were you know, going to put my four-year-old in a, a daycare or a school, I would try and find one, this is just my personal opinion, that spoke Spanish so that my child would be speaking Spanish all day long. And instead of just know, knowing one language, my child would grow up and know two. There's a saying that if you're trilingual, you speak three languages. If you're bilingual, you speak two. And if you speak one language, you're American. So I want to, to try and if I had the opportunity to do it all over again, I would put my child in, in a place like a daycare or a school that only spoke Spanish so that my child would grow up and be bilingual. So are, are you asking where those schools are? Oh, no, oh, no I'm not. I, I, guess, oh, I just guess I'm just commenting. asking you guys, if you all think that's a, a good idea, would you recommend putting your children in a school, you know, your four-year-old or your child in a place where they only speak Spanish, is that a good idea where, the, that, where they become bilingual? Because being bilingual, that gives you many, many more opportunities for um, positions on your resume, et cetera. Yeah, sure. Charlie, thank you so much. I will just say that, like, I love to travel. I've been all over the world to many uh, 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 Latin American countries, and I can't speak a lick of Spanish. I can, <laughs> I can say hola, but that's about, <laughs> that's about it. Um, and I wish, I, I, I want to speak Spanish so badly. Like, I, I was in uh, Barcelona where they speak a, a mixture of Catalan and, and, and Spanish, and I, I was in a sea of, like, I don't know what you're saying, <laughs> like, but the people were all, always great with me. Um, I, I, I've had the opportunity to uh, to go to uh, Cuba um, and could not speak the language. Um, so, yeah, I, I just to the caller's response, I think that, like, if we can all teach our children how to be bilingual, it, it's just so much, not even for the resume, but just to, like, connect and understand each other. Because I think that in this human experience that we're all going through, uh, language at times is a barrier to just understanding that someone is a lot like you. And maybe the little differences are things to be celebrated and not to be scared of. And I think if the language is not the barrier, you can begin to break that down. Right. So, so Spanish is like the second most spoken language after Mandarin. Right. And I think, you know, language is definitely a connector. Um, and to me, you know, being able to not only um, represent the language, but really connect with individuals from different backgrounds just makes you so much more, um, 
I wouldn't say successful, but better in your day-to-day because we're so different, right, from different backgrounds, even if we're within from the U.S., um, you know, with, depending on where you're from, being able to identify, being able, that, it makes you a better communicator. It makes it, it makes you a better, um, you know, a, a better person whenever you're, you know, you're trying to get your point across. And it's so much easier to learn a second language as a child. Mm-hmm. 100%. Um, yeah. Sure. Yeah. sure. I know I, Duval does provide, they do have some immersion schools. They do. Yeah, I think to answer our caller's question is it, it's important to, not necessarily just go to a school where they only speak Spanish, but I think it's important just to do research on uh, the curriculum that uh, the the schools are teaching um, for your toddlers. So, and, and most of them, uh, or I'd, I'd say several are including Spanish in there um, already. So I think it's just important just to do your research and, and find out which ones are teaching. What are the uh, predominant uh, Spanish nationalities or, or Latino nationalities in, in Jacksonville? Uh, you know, there, there's a the Mexican community, uh, there's a Puerto Rican community, um, uh, a Honduran community, mm-hmm. um, Guatemala, um, a Cuban yeah. uh, as well. So I, I think it's, there's uh, upcoming contact with quite a few and yeah. And growing and yeah. growing. growing. Yep. It's rapidly growing. You're going to have, um, you know, a lot of Venezuelans that have definitely moved into the Northeast Florida from, you know, directly from Venezuela, if not from Miami, that just continue to discover, right? I feel like Jacksonville is like this hidden gem. And as it, as it gets rediscovered, just more communities continue to come to embrace it and really to enjoy the, you know, everything that we have here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, politically, when we're talking about, um, you know, Latinos and the, the Hispanic vote, uh, I think when I think about Miami, I tend to think uh, that, specifically like and this is from reporting i did back in the day that uh, a lot of older uh, cubans were generally conservative and generally voted um and of course like you know we're making blanket statements here but just saying that like generally voted conservative and generally voted republican but that um migrants from different countries from um venezuela from you know, where, wherever, like they were uh, voting a little bit differently um, and sometimes a little bit more democratic. Do do we see like uh, specific groups like tend to vote in, in one direction or, or has it kind of equaled out now? That's a big political question. I think, yeah, that's a loaded <laughs> I, question, yeah. 100%, because, um, you know, to, to be transparent, right, from a political standpoint, I do have to remain neutral, given yeah. mm-hmm. as, you know, our organization is a nonprofit. I, 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 don't, I don't mean about you specifically. I'm talking about, like, the community on a whole. Do we see the community tend to, like, vote conservative? I think, like, the black community is interesting in ways because I think uh, at the root of it, a lot of black people are conservative uh, because of church values. A lot of black folks mm-hmm. go to, you know, and the, obviously these are blanket statements, but we tend to vote democratic and so i'm just trying to understand uh you know where that is with the hispanic community i think it would depend upon the group yeah the particular group and Mm -hmm. then also the socioeconomic um status that they have as well because obviously if uh, more of the um the programs that would assist they would probably veer towards that party rather than um, the more conservative ones that might just uh, not have those, uh, what do you want to call them, um, net, uh, the, the safety net to fall into. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and there's also the countries that they've come from and the country's experience. Um, I think that they really, uh, that really feeds into their decision as far as who to follow. Um, a lot of these countries have been ruled by dictators um, and so um, the um, the trend to to support um, democracy um, it, it's getting a little bit mixed now as far at least in terms of immigration um, it, it it used to be that uh, Republican the Republican Party was pretty much the major proponent of amnesty and um, other types of immigration reform. Um, and a, a lot of the major legislature was passed under Republican presidents. 
I mean, you um, go, you're going back to Ronald Reagan's day, right? Because I mean, Ronald Reagan really was the. If it, please correct me if I'm wrong. Ronald Reagan was the first president to really grant amnesty to uh, to you know migrants that had crossed. Um, but that that issue specifically in the Republican Party has now gone in a completely different way since since Reagan's day. It has, and it 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 was. Uh, I would say it might have been overnight just because of September 11th. Um, and, and that's when uh, you, you started to see the shift to, to what you see now. Um, but historically, you've seen border enforcement under heavy border enforcement under both both parties. Um, and you have not seen a, a push towards immigration reform from either party because it's just too politically um, loaded of an issue right now. But um we're we're seeing a current border crisis and um politically president biden's the one being blamed for it but it really is just a a a, a culmination of right. congress not dealing with the issue over the past 30 years yeah i i i've done a lot of reporting um <clears throat> in the sonoran desert uh in arizona and migrants crossing over uh specifically the reporting that i've done have been about migrant deaths that have um you know people they they cross from mexico they go in the sonoran desert they're trying to get here uh and a lot of them die um and so we 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 were doing a story about that and that was um well before biden or trump was was in office Mm -hmm. um it was during the, the the bush years and so uh, it, it just feels like uh, it's such a hot topic that keeps getting kicked down the road. And while we play political football with it, you know, people are, are dying or, or living lives that um, living lives that they have to keep undercover and be quiet about. Yeah, it's it's heartbreaking. Um, the the stories that I hear about the reasons that people make that trek to, yeah. to come here. And um, I've, I've always thought if the law were um, more welcoming, if the quotas were raised, um, if there was the ability to do it legally, people would not take such a dangerous trek to, to get to the United States. I think the biggest thing uh, when, I'm, when I'm thinking about these issues, after report, like I, I, I did reporting on this for about two or three years, and I think that the thing that came to me uh, I'm just I'm just thinking about a, a, a heartbreaking story that I reported. I was uh, uh, John Fife, who was the leader of the uh, sanctuary movement, who started the sanctuary movement. Um, I was in the Sonoran Desert with him at a camp that he has, and the camp is there to basically make sure migrants don't die in the desert, and so they put water out and so forth. And I'll never forget this. We were talking about uh, migrants crossing over and. Uh, I asked him, you know, I I said to him, like, you know, I don't think the political, uh, you know, our political gridlock is going to change. And so if the political gridlock is not going to change, why why do you keep doing this? And he pulled out a picture of a little girl and he told me that um, she was crossing the desert. She got separated from the party that she was with and she ended up dying in the desert. And uh, she was less than a mile from his camp, but she never found it. And he said that, like, that's why he does this, because he doesn't want any more little girls to die in the desert. And it it cracked my heart in two um, because it's just it's heartbreaking and senseless. Um, And I think what I came away from that is that the issue really for me and and how it gets into our politics, like I'm not whatever with the politicians, but the American people don't know who these migrants are who are crossing over and what they're coming from and what they're going to and how much they put on the line to actually do that. Um, it's so easy to, to buy into the rhetoric. Right. Yeah. And if they just mm-hmm. looked at it, it as a human issue, which is, which is really what it is, you know, yep. what is driving these folks out of their country? If the tendency is to want to be in your own country, yeah. Why is it, it, is this happening to where um, it, it's something that um, I, I, I try to relay that to folks. And I think that there's a lot happening um, now, like 
through media where there is more and more access to those stories. Um, but I, I think that that is going to be the ticket to persuade um, people in their political views if they start looking at at this issue as a, as a human issue. I'm curious, um, given uh, Governor DeSantis's uh, stance on uh, immigration and, and, and migrants crossing over, um, have you have you seen a, an, an increase in, in clients? And, and just so we can reset for the listeners, uh, Lisa Ruiz is an immigration lawyer. Yes, um, there was, it was panic this summer, um, starting in, in May when we um, realized that the law was going to get passed. The, the phone just started um, ringing off the hook. And um, clients, potential clients alike, were scared. Um, they just, they, they didn't understand. Um, there, I, I have a lot of clients that are mixed families where we have a lot of U.S. citizens uh, as one of the spouses. You know, does this mean I can't drive my husband around because he can't get a driver's license? Should we move? I mean, these were big um, fears and questions that were that were coming coming at to to me and and the the other immigration attorneys in in the area and in Florida. And and they're valid. I mean, uh, yeah, I don't know what to say to a woman who. She's a citizen, but her husband is not. And the law says if you are transporting someone who's undocumented, uh, that you, you could go to jail as well, right? Right. Um, it It's... I had to basically analyze it as best I could legally because all it would do is just infuriate me the way it was written. It just, to me, it just seems like it was a pure political stunt. And um, just kind of had a freezing effect on the amount of people coming into the state. Um, and so I had to be able to look at it um, and be able to analyze it from their perspective and be able to advise them accordingly. And um, thankfully, it's, it's being challenged and it doesn't seem to be having the same effect that we were afraid it was going to have. If, if anything, I think there's what we're seeing is an economic effect on our state, which is also terrible. Um, but at the same time, um, there, we're, we're challenging the law. We're also um, pushing forward. And um, if there's anything that the immigrant community and, and, and the Hispanic community, which is a, a big part of the immigrant community, especially here in Florida, um, if there is anything that we are, it's resilient. And we're going to find ways to move forward. Um, and um, and yes, of course, you know, try to um, work within federal law as it stands now to achieve status and to um, bring folks legally. Um, but at the same time, as U.S. citizens, um, stand up against this and call our legislators and tell us, like, this is this is not what we want. You are not representing our interests. Um, there are a lot of business owners that have lost workers. We're suffering from a labor shortage. It, it, it makes no sense to me why this was passed other than for political reasons. On that note, we're going to take a break. We are going to come back and, and keep going with the panel, uh, but uh, we will be here, and you should call in to join the conversation. But we'll be right back. 